ladies and gentlemen, I'm, uh, I'm very proud uh, to announce now a keynote speech, which uh, is mind-blowing, I tell you, he's, uh, he's the founder and uh, yeah, the acting, acting managing, managing man uh, of uh, Visual Capitalist. He, he founded the company 2010, Jeff. And um, so uh, 2010, that was after the dot-com bubble. Uh, after the financial crisis, so um, uh, lots of data coming in, more and more data, overflowing of data, and uh, I think the human mind was always uh, had problems to capture all this data. And uh, um, I, I'm very, I was very impressed. Uh, fortunately, I um, I found his visual graphics uh, super interesting from the very beginning because for me. Uh, this visual graphics, sometimes they exactly showed me what I was thinking about markets. But many times, many times, they were totally different. So the markets and the connections of the market and the relations in markets are, are were totally different than I, my, my thinking was. And uh, that was... Uh, Really, for me, uh, mind blowing, and I, I think since that time I'm following very closely. We were uh, sometimes uh, closer connected, sometimes less connected, but uh, over the time we always uh, had some emails uh, backward, forward, and uh, and then I found a LinkedIn advertising uh, from Visual Capitalist, where he uh, where we he want to build a completely new uh, Visual Capitalist app. And that's what he is uh, now on his mission. And uh, uh, what uh, I told him that uh, the, today's conference is about megatrends and uh, Jeff will showcase and highlight uh, what he is doing with uh, his data in uh, visualizing the megatrends in the world. Jeff, the stage is yours. All right, let's have some fun. Um, we're gonna have a lot of charts, a lot of graphics in here. So if you are having trouble seeing from the back, please feel free to come up front. There's lots of space. Um, it'll be easier to see. It's better than taking pictures and then casually zooming in on your phone, trying to look at what's on there. Um, so yeah, feel free to come up if you want. Um, but yeah, we're gonna be going through a lot of, uh, a lot of cool stuff. Thank you so much, Michael, for having me here. Um, really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm really excited to, to go through this, especially after we've been talking about mega trends all day. Um, so I'm doing something a little bit different here. Um, you know, everybody was talking about mega trends in the context of, you know, here is the rising tide that's floating all boats in this particular investment opportunity or, or this particular industry. And I think there's been a lot of that today. I think it's been uh, really good. It's, it's really what we concentrate on a lot of the time. Um, but I didn't want to talk about megatrends because I knew everybody would be doing it all day today. So um, what I want to do is something a little bit different. And I think it's something that everybody's going to be able to draw a little bit of value on. Um, I, I think one thing that maybe is underappreciated about today is that not only it was everybody's presentations about megatrends, uh, but they were all storytelling, right? Storytelling is the oldest form of uh, com human communication. It goes back tens of thousands of years. Um, when you think about it, every single presentation is based, you're basically just telling a story, right? And it's about how someone interprets that story. And that's what matters, right? That's, that's the difference between landing a big investment or, uh, you know, you're pitching maybe a, a limited partner on, on why your fund is better. Uh, it, it's all this, all this storytelling adds up and it makes really important differences in our lives. And I think that's true for everybody in the room. You know, you're always, everything you do is you're telling a story about yourself, right? And that all adds up into, uh, you know, what, how successful you are and, and what type of person you are and, and that kind of thing. So uh, what we're going to do is we're, Visual Capitalist is uh, sort of our hallmark is being able to take the world's big trends and, and tell their stories through data, uh, through what we call data storytelling. And so I'm going to kind of combine these two things together today. I'm going to talk about storytelling and I'm going to talk about megatrends. I'm going to dissect how we actually talk about these things. And, and maybe there's something you can pick up uh, for your own 
uh, you know, professional life or, or personal life that will be of value. So first of all, who am I and why am I up here telling you about this? Why, why should I be the one to, to have the authority to talk about this? Uh, so we're the global leaders in data storytelling. We've created over 3,000 different uh, data visualizations. Um, you know, we've built it up to be pretty big. Um, last month, we had 11 million visitors on our website. Uh, we have about 340,000 uh, email subscribers that get our email every single day. And, you, and like Michael, click through and they find something interesting. Um, and we have about a million social media followers, uh, a lot of people on there who I'll, I'll detail in a second. So what is, you know, what is 11 million visits? Well, uh, in compared to The Economist, uh, it's a, roughly about uh, you know, 80%, 90% of the size. Um, one other important thing uh, to think about how this, uh, when you think about data storytelling and the way that we tell stories about megatrends, is that it's really powerful from a shareability perspective, uh, from getting uh, that story out uh, organically. 84% uh, of the readers of Visual Capitalist, when we surveyed them, say they regularly share our content, whether it's to family, colleagues, friends, uh, on social media. So it's a very shareable type of uh, way of telling stories. And the last thing is that uh, we have really, uh, you know, we're gaining a list of VIPs that, that follow our stuff. Uh, we get name, drop, but name dropped on the Tim Ferriss podcast by Bology all the time. Uh, thank God for him. Uh, we have uh, Elon Musk tweeting out our battery metals infographics. Uh, so we have some, you know, really good people following us. So, you know, these, are, these stories are resonating with the right people. Um, and, and that's really important as well, right? I mean, it, you're, you're trying to get uh, your story spread among the audience of people that are most important for it, right? And if they're spreading it organically, then you're, you're going to get the most traction from it. So I'm going to start with something very contextual here. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the data landscape broadly, uh, what that means for how we interpret information, and, uh, and, and what that means in terms of trying to tell a story. I'm starting it with something very non-data-like. I'm starting it with a quote from the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, uh, which is, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. So it's a, a guy who's on a boat, and he's in the ocean, and he wants to have a drink of some water, but the problem is, all the water is all salty, right? Not good. This is kind of how I think about data. Um, data is, this is a crazy stat, right? Every two years, there's more new data generated than all of human history before it. And then every two years, there's another, you know, two years worth of data that's all before human history before that. So it's, it's a crazy amount of data that's being generated. It's going exponential. And, uh, and I think of that as the, uh, the rhyme of the ancient mariner in that context because it's all around, data is all around us, it's everywhere, but how much of it can we actually use? How much of it can we actually absorb? Uh, there comes a point when there's so much of it that it's overwhelming, that it's creating problems for us. Um, and this is actually a, a scientific concept called uh, information overload, which is the chart on the right. Uh, and basically what this is, is when there becomes too much data to be processed by your brain, eventually your decision-making ability actually goes down. Uh, you're trying to understand too much, and as a result of it, your uh, decision quality uh, drops. So this is kind of our, our being. Um, this is a quote from E.O. Wilson. We are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. There's so much data, but what we really need is we want that, that nugget, that insight. We want to understand uh, we want to understand the world, and we, we don't want to have all this conflicting data that is telling us different stories. We want to have something that we understand and that is true and, and, and that is the wisdom. Uh, and then the other important implication of this, and, and you, you all uh, fall into this category, which is the world will be run by synthesizers, people that are able to put together the right information at the right time, think critically about it, and make important choices uh, wisely. And so, again, this is what... Uh, this is what this is about. It's about, when I think about storytelling, I'm thinking about how do we take 
the most interesting and compelling data and facts and story, and how do I take it and make it stand out amongst all of this other information? How do, I, how do I make it have that insight that connects with people? And here's a mental model for that. Uh, the upper leftmost panel is data, it's just a bunch of random dots. Information, you're kind of categorizing it, different colors, right? Knowledge is you're starting to connect these things together. Insight is you're saying, hey, actually this thing kind of leads to this thing. And that connecting of those two, uh, that, that pathway is, is you start to understand something, right? Wisdom is having gone on that path and knowing where it leads and, and uh, having been there before and, and knowing that that insight is true based on your own actual experience. And then you get to the what, what is the really hard part and the most interesting part and a lot of what I'm going to be focusing on, which is the impact. How do you take this and convey it and make an impact? When we're creating stories, we're all starting from this standpoint of having this data, which is this upper leftmost panel. But that's not good enough, right? There's so much data out there. Uh, it's telling us all kinds of different things. Uh, what you need to do is you need to create the story that makes the impact so that people remember what you're talking about. How do we do it? We do it through data visualization or through data storytelling. So we take the data that we find to be the most compelling and insightful and we convert it into a visual format, either infographics or data visualizations or charts or uh, interactive pieces or videos, and, and we try and show that data in a way that's memorable and a, a way that you can look at it and uh, absorb that information fast, uh, intuitively, and, uh, and get something out of it, right? 65% of people are visual learners, so doing things this way is, uh, you're really getting, you're hitting the majority of people this way. So that begs the question, what is data storytelling and why is it relevant and how does it work? Weirdly, if you go back 45,000 years, the very first things that humans were doing was a form of data storytelling. Sure, cave art, you're thinking, okay, people are just sitting around in caves, you know, drawing stuff, whatever. What, what's the big deal, right? Well, actually, they were drawing different scenes, uh, conveying uh, different aspects of data of what's happening in their lives, right? They were saying, hey, um, you know, here's uh, how this particular uh, ceremony works. Or, hey, you know what? I actually saw a buffalo in the woods today, so I'm recording that. Um, and, and so there's different types of data that is being conveyed in a lot of that artwork, uh, whether, whether, you, whether you think about it that way or not. Um, and, and there you go. The first sort of uh, oldest cave painting was uh, found in Indonesia and shows a pig. Uh, so it's, you know, people saying, hey, this is an animal we found, uh, we know where it is, and it's delicious. Uh, oral tradition came slightly after that. Um, so it's more than just talking, it's oral tradition is, uh, it's a dynamic way of, of telling stories in a way that gets passed down from generation to generation, such that that data actually uh, stays in the knowledge of uh, families and, and of generations. And so... Um, you know, in Australia, uh, indigenous tribes, uh, there is a volcano that erupted and they wanted to keep on telling the story about that so that it could be related to future generations. Hey, if you go near this mountain, it might do something that's pretty scary, so you should be aware that this is happening. So it's, it's a way of passing down data. This is a little bit less of data storytelling in the visual sort of modern way that we think about it, but it's still passing down that data and message in a way that resonates and, and makes an impact so people remember it. The more things change, the more they stay the same. You, you take these ancient uh, cave art and now you have what we have today. We have charts and data visualizations and infographics and motion graphics, maps, interactive pieces. And actually, if you think about the presentations that you saw today, if you think about how uh, Florian showed hyperinflation in, uh, in Weimar, Germany, or if you think about how Arash showed the history of... Um, of uh, basically the renaissance in, in plant medicine, and he used four different uh, line charts to show that. This is all forms of, uh, of data storytelling, and people have been doing it all day today, which is really cool. Uh, I was watching all the presentations today, and there's some aspect of it in all these presentations, right? And that's what makes them compelling. 
And so, you know, what this talk is about is, is kind of codifying that a bit and saying what aspects of that, uh, you know, it, it provides the most value and gets people going and, and helps them understand the most, right? So data storytelling is simply the fusion of three different things. It's narrative, so that's the story that this, the story that um, the arc, uh, the you know that aspect of it. There's visuals, so that can you know take place in a number of ways, and then there's of course the data itself, and all of these things work together to make the big impact here. So the foundation, obviously, and, and, and to me, I think this is the hardest part. I, I think having uh, going from having data to having the sort of most compelling points, I think that's the sort of the trickiest thing because once you have that, then, and, and spend a lot of your time there, right? Once you have that, then it makes it a lot easier to build out the right narrative. But just having data is not enough, right? You have to find the insights and you have to go through that whole mental model of where can I make the impact with, with what I have? The narrative, this, this is what we've been talking about already, which is storytelling. This has been around forever, and it's worth noting that there are a bunch of, uh, you know, typical conventions for storytelling. Uh, you have the hero's journey. If you ever watch Star Wars or any of these movies, they all follow this exact cycle of a call to adventure, a supernatural, uh, supernatural aid, crossing the threshold, and then going all the way, and, and uh, going from known to unknown and back to known. And um, it's an extremely common framework that gets used all the time. There's also basic things like, um, you know, having sort of, sort of the way the plays are built with acts, right? Uh, you, you also have sort of the, the rising action and, and the falling action, the denouement, and that kind of stuff, right? So if you think about all these different conventions, there are different ways that are uh, tried and true, you know, proven ways of telling stories and communicating a point to someone. And... Um, you know, these are, these are not limited to just art and things like that. You can think of these in the context of investing in markets, how you tell your story to, to someone else. Um, you know, can you apply these frameworks in different ways? We do it all the time. Then the last part is uh, simply visuals, right? There's many different forms of visuals that you can use to convey your point. Uh, for complex data or for simple data. Uh, some of the types of, of things that we've seen today are going to be on the more simple side, right? It's going to be a line chart or something like that, that and that's super useful. Uh, but these can be a lot more complex, as you've probably seen around things that are interactive, that uh, you click on a button some, somewhere and it, it changes something according to your age or according to you know, different parameters. So these things can be quite complex as well. But these are all different ways of, of fusing information together in a way to understand a story. This is just a variety of, of different visualizations, and, and you'll see maps here, you'll see uh, Voronoi diagrams here, the one on the, the right, you'll see, um, you know, kind of bubble charts, uh, you know, so, some really rich area graphs in here too. Uh, so there's all kinds of different slightly more complex ways of, of, of telling these stories in really powerful ways. Um, you even have uh, something a little bit more literal here. You see the, uh, in the upper left, you see a barrel of oil that's broken down literally into parts to dissect you know, how much oil is being used for different things. So there's, there's different interesting ways to do this. I'm going to take a quick little detour and I'm going to talk about the evolution of media. And, and this is um, you know, seemingly random, but it's gonna, stick with it and, and you'll understand what I'm getting at. But it, it, it basically has to do with the ecosystem that we are working in today uh, of how we are getting our message out and getting it out in front of people. So the first wave of media, all of you will remember this, right? This is, uh, this is you know, pre-social media. This is uh, in order to get eyeballs, you had to advertise literally on a uh, radio show or a cable news network or a newspaper or whatever. It's a one-way form of communication. Uh, there's many fewer channels, much bigger barriers to entry, and times were much simpler back then, right? You tried to tell your story and you paid for the reach, and then you got it out there and, and people looked at your message and decided if it was worthy or not. Uh, there, there are some, yeah big problems with this, this kind of form of communication from the perspective of 
you know, competition and, and the way that things work. But from some perspectives, it was, it was kind of nice, right? Then social media came. And when you look at social media, there are some big pros to it, right? I mean, we have two-way communication. We can send out messages uh, to people, but then they can also respond back. Uh, brands can interact with people. Companies can interact with people. You know, as uh, as all of the um, as all the companies that are seeking investments have found out. Right now, you're interacting one-on-one -on -one with investors in all these really unique ways that never happened before. Uh, it used to be by phone or or whatever, but now there's all these other channels. Um, some of the problems that occur because of this are, are really interesting as well. You have bias and filter bubbles that have uh, showed up. So uh, that being uh, algorithms start to control everything, right? And so uh, from a bias and filter bubble perspective, that's like you are so far down a rabbit hole and when you start to uh, search on Google or when you, you start to look at your social media feed, everything is reinforcing your confirmation bias. Uh, it's all telling you the same thing that you believe, and you're not seeing uh, varying points of view. Um, this is what has fueled outrage culture. I know a bunch of people here are big fans of it in here. Um, joking. Um, fake, fake news uh, was obviously an issue that cropped up a few years ago that a lot of people were talking about. Uh, and then algorithms in general are, are, are kind of like a challenge, right? Uh, every day, if you have a, uh, a company, uh, you're forced to deal with this uh, because social media and, and Google and all of these different tools are great, but they're uh, using their algorithms and you have to build your stuff around the algorithms to try and compete with them, right? So you're, we're in a constant fight to create the most compelling content to get eyeballs. Uh, if you're an investor, you're looking at uh, algorithms as you know helping sort uh, companies for you, right? You're, it's not a natural process. You're seeing the uh, if you're looking at social media, if you're looking at Google, if you're looking at different websites, you're seeing what's being fed to you on an algorithmic basis. So it's important to understand that. Um, you're not necessarily seeing the best things. You're seeing the things that might be getting the most engagement, right? So uh, this is something that's important to understand in, in this second wave of media. I'm advocating that there's beginning to be a third wave of media, though. And this is kind of the stuff that we're about. I think people are tired of the, uh, the algorithms. They're tired of all of the opinion and outrage. They're tired of the, the bias and all this kind of stuff. And what I see is people are migrating more to a data-driven uh, type of system of sharing information. And this really took off during COVID. Um, before COVID, uh, nobody ever communicated things in exponential charts. Uh, but because of COVID and, and flattening the curve and, and of showing how, uh, how the pandemic was going, you had to use these exponential uh, logarithmic charts, and all of a sudden, these data visualizations became commonplace in our life. Uh, so I, I guess that's one good thing to come out of it. But um, this is really how things are moving. People are communicating in data-driven ways. They're trying to, uh, they're, they're, they want to show that their information is transparent. They, this is the source of the data, uh, and you can verify it in this way. Of course, Web3 and all that stuff will come in here as well. You'll be able to validate data sources instantaneously. Um, everything is sourced, so you know where that information comes from. It's repl replicable, so you can uh, take that data and, and move it somewhere else. Uh, and it's going to eventually be more decentralized. And, uh, and, and this is important because it's going to change how information flows and, and how uh, people get information and how it gets communicated. Um, importantly, also, by having data instantly uh, verifiable and, and it being able to be uh, exact, you can know exactly where it comes from and if it's real and, and you understand the sources. I mean, that's going to change how we consume information. There's not going to be that, necessarily going to be that opinion layer on top of it that we get with uh, the other two types of media. Uh, so the con to this is that there's no dedicated platform really de uh, devoted to this yet. Uh, and, and that's the thing that Michael alluded to at the beginning, which I'll, I'll talk about more at the end. OK. Things we think about. So this is all with regards to data storytelling. These are the things that we think about as we are putting these things together. Um, and then after this, I'm going to go through 12 different examples of data storytelling that we've done and, and explain some of the principles behind them. So I think a lot about the utility equation. Basically, it's the um, amount of meaning that people get divided by the amount of time that it takes them to consume that. Um, so 
really, this is just, a, you know, it's a really simple way, a, a simple mental exercise of communicating or thinking about the amount of value that someone is getting for the amount of time that they're actually spending looking at it. Um, in the modern world, if you're going to make something really long, it better, it better have a lot of value, right? Otherwise, people are going to go for the shorter 15-second TikTok clip or 140-word uh, tweet or 140-character tweet that is uh, funny. It's short and it has some value, but it's not, uh, you know, it, it's not crazy. One other thing is that we all get different things out of data, so this is important to think about uh, when you're either communicating data or when you're uh, examining data that other people have uh, are trying to communicate to you. Uh, so the context. Um, there's, you know, there's different understandings of the context uh, around data, right? So um, everybody goes and everyone has unique experience, right? And so everybody is approaching data from having a different level of, of context going into that situation. Um, the same thing goes for experience. People have different personal and pro uh, professional experiences. And, uh, and so that dictates how you think about uh, data, that, that frames your way of thinking about uh, seeing information for the first time. People have different level of data literacy. This is kind of a literal, well, literacy. This is a literal thing that um, is kind of funny because sometimes people are just not gonna get something because they, they're, they're not data literate. And so how you present data is really important because some people just aren't gonna get it. Um, and, and so depending on the type of crowd that you're presenting it to, you have to, you have to know your audience, obviously. What is, the level of, um, what is the level of data literacy they have and what kind of charts can you present to them? Um, and then of course, cognitive biases also frame this stuff as well. Um, my favorite cognitive bias, by the way, is uh, cursive knowledge. Uh, and so this is a cognitive bias where someone who knows a lot about something and has been doing it for many years, uh, you, kind of for, you kind of forget how to communicate something in the most basic sense. Um, so this is like, um, this is like the, the geologist that's been, uh, you know, a geologist for 40 years and they're trying to communicate something really basic about geology and it's, really hard for them to communicate because they have known this stuff for so long and you start to lose that, um, you know, teach me it like I'm five years old kind of thing, right? And so we often forget that other people don't have the same level of knowledge as us in certain areas. So um, that's one other area that can be influence, uh, influencing how we, what we get out of data, right? Some people might not have the same context that you have. Data is not intuitive by default. Um, imagine I pass you a messy and complicated spreadsheet. You're not going to know what to do with it, right? Um, data is messy and it's complicated. And when you pass it from person to person, it means different things. And that's why it's so important to, uh, to really uh, hone down what the message of data is. And, and you know, the larger and more diverse the group is that you're communicating data to, especially if you're communicating, communicating in a really open um, unrefined format, just like we showed on the last slide. Everybody has different experiences, different ways of interpreting data. And so uh, the reaction that you can get from people can be very different. Uh, people can think of something in very different ways. And to be honest, this is the case even with very refined data. Garbage in is garbage out. Um, this is a phrase that it normally comes with, um, you know, uh, basically like, uh, taking in really bad data, and then of course you can't get quality decision making outside of that. But the way that I'm using this is actually a little bit different. Um, for me, the most compelling visual storytelling um, that will not make up for bad or uninteresting data. And, and so this is a visualization. This is a tr it's called a tree map visualization. Usually very useful. Uh, whatever the person that made this, and it wasn't me, uh, whoever made this thing was actually trying to show the number of different models of cell phones that people use, and there's a bunch of them, and you can't really look at this and get any useful information from it, and that's just, the, that's just something that they didn't think about when they put this together. It's not useful at all. Um, data and visuals without storytelling can be useful. That's just, you know, like a stock chart or something like that. Um, but it also, there's a really big difference between this and, and, and the same thing with storytelling. Um, so this is, a, this is a literal, uh, you know, line chart that I saw in an article I was reading. And I was like, I don't, it takes me a second to understand what the hell it's showing. 
And here, they didn't even include the company name or the logo or anything of what's going on. But weirdly, we had made the same chart a long time ago. And so I connected it back to this. This is uh, Facebook's volatile years. Literally the same chart, right? But um, one of them has Mark Zuckerberg riding on a roller coaster. And, uh, and it has a lot of stats around it. It has a lot of storytelling around it to give you context of what happened that year. Uh, so the st storytelling element, even just the, the quick um, analogy that it's a roller coaster, that really conveys the point in a way that the previous chart doesn't. And in fact, even really basic things aren't communicated on the last chart. You don't know that it's Facebook. You don't know that it's showing a particular year of their stock price. And so all of these really basic things are really important for somebody understanding the actual uh, story. This is, I think, the most important thing in this, this section. Uh, this is Seth Godin, who is a uh, marketing genius. Um, he thinks about this, uh, he, he thinks about modern currency in terms of uh, how people um, allocate their time and, and energy to, uh, to things. He thinks of it in sort of two ways. He thinks there's attention and there's trust. So you, and, and what's really interesting about this is that the two things are often sacrificed for each other because someone wants one or the other thing, right? So um, if you want attention, you can get that by sacrificing trust, right? You can, you can say something really uh, crazy and people will be like, okay, you got my attention. But then if that thing that you say turns out to be not trustworthy, then all of a sudden you've, you've lost all that trust, right? It's the Warren Buffett quote, right? You can build up trust uh, your whole life, but uh, in five minutes you can, or in five seconds you can, you can get rid of all of it, right? So, um, and then on, on the flip side, oh, that's in normal, uh, in like modern times, it's usually that. Uh, it's usually that. It's trading the attention for trust. But the other thing, it can happen the other way as well, right? You can, uh, you can uh, give up attention for, uh, for trust. And, and this happens with something like um, Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia has built up some level of trust over a really long time, but they're not doing it by trying to be fancy or trying to create these uh, word plays that get you interested in, or they're not copywriting, or they're not giving you, you know, wild facts. Uh, they're, they're trying to be a, a resource over time, and so they've sacrificed that attention to, to build that trust. Um, so how do you balance these two things, right? It, it's, it, it seems like a lot of the time you're doing one at the expense of the other, right? So that's really the big question in communicating anything. How do you balance getting people's attention and keeping it with maintaining trust. Uh, this is, I call framing. Framing is when you are about to present a story to someone and you're trying to uh, tell them what it's going to be. Um, this is what I call disappointing framing. Um, here's the, for those that can't read the caption, it says, I'm a food scientist and this trick makes your coffee less bitter. It's a 550 word article that basically just says, add salt to your coffee. So when I see this, I'm like, cool, you got my attention and you made me click on this thing, but all you had to say was salt. You didn't have to write 550 words about it, and now I'm just never going to go to this website ever again. Um, here's something that we put together that uses compelling framing, and this is, think of it in terms of attention and trust. Um, attention, we get your attention because it's a really cool visual that, uh, that captures your eye. Uh, so this is showing 50 years of gaming uh, history by revenue stream. Uh, and, and even just the concept itself, right, is a powerful concept from an attention standpoint. You know, you want to know uh, over 50 years, um, you know, what, what different revenue streams of gaming, whether it's PC or mobile or consoles or, or all these different things, which ones have been the most successful and how did they fade in and out uh, over the years, right? So that concept itself, even though it's a data-driven concept, is still really interesting. Um, and that it spans 50 years, that it has these, these known brands and characters. You can see sort of Pikachu on there and you can see Pac-Man, these, these people that you will recognize. Um, even though it's, it's sort of, you know, truthful and that's exactly what you get when you see it, it's still compelling, right? It's, it's, it's trustworthy and uh, attention grabbing at the same time. 
So now I'm going to go through 12 different examples of ways that you can stand out with data storytelling, and I'm going to use our own storytelling as, an uh, as a sort of visual proof of that thing. So comparing the Titanic with a modern cruise ship, I'm sure this is all a question that you've had at some point in your life. So you're like, the Titanic is so big, right? But how big is it actually, right? Well, here's a visual comparison that we put together. We showed, here's the Royal Caribbean Symphony of the Sea, which is the world's biggest cruise ship. Here's the Titanic, and here's uh, the iceberg that the Titanic hit, and here's the size of an Airbus plane and a school bus and so on, right? So you have the exact context going all the way from the smallest thing to the biggest thing. And, uh, and so I call this one context is king. If you are putting together a, a data story, whether it's about an investment or anything, um, the way that you create the context around it really frames the story, right? And the more context that you can provide, the better. And that's in a megatrends context, this is really important too, right? If, you're, if your story is about a... Uh, about a particular uh, company, you want to put that in the context of the industry and the mega trend that is shaping that company. You want to understand the relationship of those two things. Connect the dots for people. So this just this chart just literally shows countries by their largest trading partner. It's a really simple idea. It turns out though that it's um, it actually gives some insights right away just by looking at it. You can actually see Germany uh, connected to all these different trade partners. You can see China, which is now the world's largest trade partner, connected to all these, uh, many of these other countries, countries in Asia, Africa, and so on. And then you can see the countries that the U.S. connects to as well. And so if you were to go and look at this in depth and study it, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can kind of get grasp from this. And we actually, on our site, we have this as a collection of three different years. So we did it 2020, 1990, and 1960, I think. So you can actually see how it evolves over time. But it's a really simple concept, by, but by visualizing it and connecting the dots between these things, you can actually see really what's going on in a way that it's, if you were to look at the raw data, it would be really much harder to grasp. Do the unexpected. Uh, so this was a visualization we did at the start of COVID. It's our most famous and well-known visualization. You've probably seen it. We've had people react it on TV with big sponge balls and all kinds of weird stuff. Um, but uh, this had, I think, 14 million views. Uh, but basically what we did is we took the history of pandemics and we made each pandemic the size uh, based on how many deaths occurred. Uh, we, we made the size of it a ball, sort of in the shape of a coronavirus, but not quite... And we, then we put them on this weird timeline thing that goes uh, from uh, modern times all the way back to ancient times. Uh, so it's doing it in a couple different ways here, but um, whatever it was, it worked. And I can tell you that this is not a, a typical data visualization technique. We made this up. We thought it was interesting, and we, we put it together, and, and it, uh, it blew up. Uh, so when you do something unexpected, it captures people's uh, attention. Um, again, the key is how can you do something unexpected, but that's still interesting and, and that's, that's um, trustworthy, right? So luckily, you know, everything here is from an information and data perspective is pretty solid. So, um, you know, the tr what, even once people realize that this is different, but it's still correct and it's good data and it's, you can learn something from it, then, you know, people, uh, that adds even more value. Answer the unanswered question. Uh, so this is simply a donut chart that shows what the Earth's surface is made of. Like, I didn't want to know that, but here it is, and you look at it, and you're like, oh, crap. Like, you see Russia and Canada and China and the United States, and of course you see the ocean, and we all know that ocean makes up the majority of the landmass, but when you look at it, you're like, wow, that's pretty wild. And it's, it's not something that you expect to um, knock people's socks off. But again, like this one that we published had, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of traction. And it's, um, it's really the simplest thing. But you're answering a question that people have that they don't know that they have, uh, which, of course, is a bit of an art to figure out. Keep it simple, stupid. This is a hilarious visualization that we do every year. Um, what we do is at the beginning of every year, we take 
about 300 different reports from leading uh, publications, so like your McKinsey's and, and your The Economist or uh, all these different media or think tanks or whatever. We take all of their predictions for the next year and then we aggregate them all and then we summarize them with this stupid bingo card. And the bingo card is simply, here's a prediction for the next year and then the number of dots that it has is the number of times that was uh, predicted by all these different sources. And so these are 2022's predictions. You can see some of these have already come true. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's a really simple execution on an idea that takes a lot of work. Again, we are combing through 300 different reports to put together all of this information on what's going to happen in the next year. And then all we put together, all we put out is this simple bingo card. But when you look at it, you can, uh, you can, you can see a lot in a really small condensed space. be impartial to buy credibility. I think that's a big problem with the sort of modern uh, information and, and media environment. I think people are too uh, biased and, and too, um, you know, they're, they're too drawn to talking about their own point of view. Um, what we try and do is the exact opposite of that. We try and use data as a way of creating an even playing field uh, so that we're impartial about what we're showing, so that when you look at it, you understand that uh, you know, we can be trusted because we're not trying to infuse it with the point of view. We're just trying to show you what's going on. So what is this? This is, the, uh, this is how long it would take to read different terms of service agreements for all these different platforms. So uh, we, visualized, we, we basically looked at how many words were in each agreement, and then we visualized all of them. We could have turned this into a piece of why Facebook is the worst or uh, you know, whatever we want to do, right? But instead, what we did is we just showed all of these platforms directly against each other. We didn't have any prejudice as to what was what. We just wanted to show you this is how long each term of service agreement is. And you can come to your own conclusions, be conclusions because you are smart. Storytelling techniques. This is what I was talking about earlier, if, uh, back when I was talking about the, um, you know, the hero's journey and things like this. And so in this case, we did this, um, we actually did this with uh, Jim, Re Jim Rickards. And uh, we, we did a, it was a story, it was a branded content story about how market complexity could cause the next crash. And so the idea was, um, you know, you're on, a, you're on this high mountain and uh, it's been snowing for days, right? And any snowflake could trigger the next avalanche. But you don't know what snowflake it's going to be. It could be this one, it could be that one, it could be a million snowflakes from now. It's a, just a very complex situation, right? So this is just, uh, you know, this is an analogy in this situation. Um, so it's, it's leaning heavily on the more narrative aspect of, of data storytelling, but, um, but this can be a really valuable way of making a point if you have the right uh, analogy or metaphor or, or what have you. Colors can tell the story. Uh, two things to note on this. One is that um, this is a really cool color palette we use. It's called the Veritas color palette. Um, and I'm colorblind uh, with red and green colors. I can't see the difference between them. Um, and this uh, palette is actually built for everybody, including uh, color deficient people uh, like myself. And, um, and what it does is it's visible. Even if you're red, green, colorblind, you should be able to tell all the differences in, in color here. Uh, or if you're, uh, if you're color deficient in other ways. But anyways, uh, colors tell the story here. Um, we use color in this instance to show the median age of different continents. Um, this is a year or two old, but it's, um, I mean, it's really striking, right? When you look at Africa's median age and you realize that it's 18, literally the middle, the middle of the age group is 18, right? So half of people are younger than that, which is wild. Uh, so now it's, now their median age is uh, 19 or 20. Uh, it's moved up since then. Um, but then you can see North America. We, we show you the oldest countries here and so on. But, but really it's, you know, it's, it's a way, the color really makes it stand out. It makes it, you can look at it right away and you understand the message, right? And so this is a really important aspect of any type of communication, uh, of any uh, visual diagram, you can use color to the, your benefit. Show something familiar. This is a map of the, uh, the Great Lakes region. Oh yeah, and we also added in all the other world's biggest lakes, uh, all, in the same, all in the same map. So it's not, uh, it's not just the Great Lakes, you have 
the Caspian Sea, which is actually a lake. Uh, you have you know all these other ones in there too, Great Bear Lake or or Lake Winnipeg, and but really it's kind of a cool way to see them all together, and you can actually. Uh, get a visual representation of how big these things are relative to one, one another. But because we're using the familiar Great Lakes map as sort of the base for it, it really makes it, um, when you look at it, you just you sort of recognize it, right? And so having something that's instantly recognizable can help you make an impact with this kind of thing. Have clear takeaways. This is a, a big one that... Uh, people screw up, right? You have a complex bunch of information and then you don't actually have a takeaway that people can walk home with. Um, so here it is, um, where will the next 1,000 babies be born? This is, this we published uh, a couple of weeks ago. By the way, um, we're about to hit 8 billion people uh, in the world in around November 15th is when we estimate it'll happen. So uh, that's a big mega trend that's happening right now is, um, you know, what is it like? What is the world like at 8 billion people? Is it, are, are we going to continue adding people or is it eventually going to cut off? Uh, so all of that's a topic of conversation. But back to the point here, what is the clear takeaway? Well, there's 172 babies born out of, out of the next thousand babies in India and 103 of those would be in China. And you look at something like Canada or, or Germany and they barely appear on the map, right? It shows you how small uh, we are in, in terms of this, you know, future population growth. Um, all of the action is going to be in three or four places, right? Not often are we literal, but sometimes being literal can, can be uh, really impactful. This is a Voronoi diagram that shows natural gas production by countries in the world. And yeah, we made it uh, literally a natural gas like stove. Um, but it kind of works, right? It, it, you know it, what it is when you look at it, and, and um, I don't even have the title of it on here, but you could probably figure it out if you're just looking at it. But it makes it more impactful. It makes people look at it, and they're like, um, I, you know, it, it makes them easier for to connect the point of exactly what's going on here, right? And so we don't do this all the time, but sometimes by being really literal, you can drive a point home. And then be memorable is, uh, is our final one here. Uh, this, this we decided to say, okay, how could we show all of the metals ever mined uh, over the course of the last year? And we decided to literally visualize it all. Um, and so you can see it's a bit, you know, iron, iron ore is not really a metal, right? It's an ore, but whatever. It's, you get the picture, right? This is how much iron ore is mined versus all this other stuff. Um, and of course, when you zoom in and you look at some of the things that uh, the people are exploring for here, the, the really rare things, uh, you realize how small they are in the grand scheme of things. Um, you can see gold or, or rare earths or, or whatever you want to look at down in this tiny little segment on the bottom right there. Um, so it really paints the picture, but it's memorable, right? You're, you're probably, not going to, probably not going to forget this because... You know, who makes a giant 3D visualization of all the metals ever mined? Um, it's impactful. So as a final point, I promised Michael I would talk about our, our app. I didn't want to plug what we're doing, but it fits in the context of, of what we're talking about here. And, and so basically what we're doing is um, our goal with the VC app is we're, we want to... Let's, start, let's think of it this way. Every time there's a new type of media, there becomes some sort of platform that is the dominant form of that media, right? So for mobile photography, it was Instagram. For short form video, it was TikTok or Snapchat. Uh, for live streaming, it was Twitch. And what we want to do is we want to be that for data storytelling. We want to take all of our stories, the things, some of the things that we were showing you there, but also the stories of the thousands or tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of other creators that do work like what we do taking data and visualizing it in really cool ways and putting it all in one place to cover every single niche. And so that's what we're building as a platform to connect everything together and one that Michael has uh, graciously supported and uh, that support has brought me here today. And with that, that's, that's a wrap. Jeff, it was a pleasure. I really have to say, I uh, very much enjoyed uh, 
um, listen to this uh, presentation about uh, story daily telling with data and uh, making data more visualizing and uh, that we understand you know when we when we're looking at pictures uh, we always understand pictures much quicker than uh, when we have to read text and uh, and uh, pictures show so much more power are so much more powerful than uh, than text and um, and i think uh, with um, what he is doing now with his uh, vc app uh, visual capitalist app uh, is uh, and that he is allowing also third party qualified and certified uh, providers data providers which are visualizing data uh, using the same platform is uh, is amazing because um, people like me, uh, I'm very interested in uh, what's going on in the economy, what's going on in the world. Um, it's about uh, finding out about what 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 kind of things are happening, and uh, and I think this is important because it will, they will have an impact on us, and um, and it helped me with my own decisions to moving things in the right direction or investing in the right sector when I have this uh, powerful visualizing uh, data yeah and um, therefore um, I'm uh, I supported that uh, with a donation to his uh, uh, to this to develop this app uh, I'm very very proud about that I have to say because this is something what will change and make the world a better, better world and I think this is important <laughs>